Hello, everyone. I'm James Dobson, and you're listening to Family Talk, a listener-supported ministry. In fact, thank you so much for being part of that support for James Dobson Family Institute. When your life is over, how do you hope people will honor your name? You ever thought about what you want to be remembered for? Well, today on Family Talk, we're going to hear from a late sports icon who lived a God-honoring life, and people are still remembering his life even today. I'm Roger Marsh, and I'm joined in studio once again by our host, Dr. James Dobson. And Dr., today's guest on the broadcast really did leave a legacy by faithfully serving God every second of his time on earth, didn't he? Well, the man we're going to hear from again today is an individual who finished well to his last breath. We're going to hear the words of Coach John Wooden from UCLA, who went on to be with the Lord at the age of 99, and he left a legacy that is as rich and meaningful as any that we could ever aspire to. I got acquainted with him near the end of his life. I had an opportunity to interview him, and what a delightful man he was. Everybody loved John Wooden who knew him. Uh, it's interesting. We developed quite a friendship, and he sent me a basketball that he had signed, and he forgot it, and he sent me a second one, and then he forgot that and sent me a third. So I've got three basketballs signed by John Wooden, and I'm proud of every single one of them. Um, at the beginning of the recorded conversation that we're going to hear today, which is part two of our discussion together. He was one of the winningest coaches in basketball history there at UCLA, and he's been honored in so many ways. In 2003, he received the Presidential Medal of Freedom, which is the nation's highest civilian honor. President George W. Bush remarked that, uh, quote, Coach Wooden remains a part of our lives as a teacher of the game and as an example of what a good man should be. And I echo those words today. Well, that's right, Doctor. And I'm really excited to share the second part of this recording with our listeners. Uh, Coach Wooden passed along such timeless wisdom that still directly applies to our lives. On today's broadcast, he's going to share some more wonderful stories and also some practical concepts that he used in coaching students under his care. His sensible teaching and wisdom will certainly speak to everyone, even those in our listening audience who don't really follow sports all that much. With that, Doctor, let's rejoin your classic conversation with Coach John Wooden when he was 93 years old. You have uh, for many years been speaking on a uh, an idea that you've wanted to convey to young people throughout the, you know a good part of your professional career uh, describe it for us well in my early years of teaching i became a little bit disappointed at what i thought parents of youngsters in my english classes expected from their youngsters and if they didn't get an A or B I found many parents thought that uh, that either the youngster had failed or or the teacher had failed and I didn't like that way of judging at all I didn't think that was fair because the good Lord and his infinite wisdom didn't treat us all equal as uh, as intelligence concern any more than we're equal as far as size or appearance or we're not coming to the same environments etc and I wanted to come up with something else I wanted to coin my own definition which would be a little different uh, from uh, Mr. Webster's I thought this could help me become a better teacher and give the youngsters under my supervision something to which to aspire other than just, just higher marks in the classroom or more points in some um, athletic endeavor. And uh, I, I thought about this and, and uh, I, uh, several things came to mind. One was uh, my father saying, never try to be better than somebody else and never cease trying to be the best you can be. And in a class, a discussion of success that I recalled some years before, then I ran across a simple verse that said, At God's footstool, to confess, a poor soul knelt and bowed his head. I failed, he cried. The master said, Thou didst thy best. That is success. I like that. Hmm. And I think that is when, when you individually know you, you did your best. So from that, I coined my own definition of success, which is peace of mind attained only through self-satisfaction and knowing you made the effort to do the best of which you're capable. Nobody else knows that but you, because you can fool everybody else. And, mm-hmm. But that wasn't serving the purpose for which I had hoped and 
So I, uh, I, I tried to wonder what I could do, and I came to the conclusion after analyzing it a bit that if I could come up with something you could see, and here again, like so many things popped out from the hidden recesses of the mind, uh, something that I'd seen years before called a ladder of achievement. Somebody had taken the ladder, five rungs on the ladder, and they had named each rung of the ladder some particular trait or characteristic that this individual felt was necessary to get to the top of the ladder, where we'd all like to get. We might differ on what we consider at the top of the ladder to be, but we'd like to get there. And there's nothing wrong with ambition, as long as it's kept under control. And uh, that gave me an idea of a pyramid. Mm-hmm. And I worked on that for the next 14 years. I placed Pyramid the, of success. Mm-hmm. I placed my definition of success at the apex and then started working from the bottom. And the uh, first two blocks I ever chose were the cornerstones, uh, industriousness and enthusiasm. And they are essential. Now you have a training program for young people that's being used uh, all across the country and has been for a number of years. Uh, that incorporates that. Yes, sir. And the name of the training program is? I'm doing it with Mr. Garen, and it is the John R. Wooden course. I guess that's what it's called. And it consists yeah. of um, materials, videos? Yeah, and Yes, and, and all from the pyramid. Uh, all from the pyramid. different, different things uh, from there. <laughs> yeah. I spoke to the players um, one time at the beginning of the year on the pyramid. I took some time and explained each block and talked to them one time. And then I would say, any of you want to come in and talk to me about it, fine. And some did and some didn't. Let me give you an example. Um, Louis Southcenter, uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, on a, um, a interview, uh, the, um, the interviewer asked him, uh, what do you think about Coach Wooden's pyramid? And he said, when I came to school, I thought it was the corniest thing I'd ever seen. <laughs> he said, before I, before I got out of school, I, I saw it was kind of meaningful, but I never realized how much until a number of years after I was out of school. And that's come from a lot of the players, and that's, that sort of pleases me. I, I, what, it's what happens to them afterwards. I like uh, Amos Alonzo Stagg. Uh, most of you probably never heard of Amos Alonzo Stagg. He was a great football coach when the University of Chicago had outstanding football teams. And... Um, after one, one fine year, a, a reporter said, uh, well, Coach Stagg, is this your finest year? And he said, I won't know for 25 or 30 years. In other words, more concerned of what's gonna happen to all those under his supervision after they're gone than right at the moment. I, I've always liked that statement. You, uh, you have had a lifelong love for the Bible. That came from your father, I believe. Yes, I think so. Do uh, you still read it and study it? Yes, I do. Is it still meaningful to you? Does it still speak to you? Indeed. Uh, you carry a cross with you. I do. You have it with you today? I do. Could I see it? Yes. <laughs> it was given to me by my minister in South Bend, Indiana, when I uh, joined List in the Service. And uh, I've got is. some other little things here, too. Yeah. And then another cross. Uh huh. Uh, is that money or is and that this, something else? Just a little came from Rome. It's just, this, this is the one that my uh. used to get me. It has Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, and it has the uh, the heart and the monad. It, it, why do you and carry it? I think I know, but tell us. Give me a piece. I, I had that in my hand uh, all the basketball games, and I think... They didn't know it, but I think officials should have been happy that I had that in my hand. <laughs> <laughs> and you have carried it virtually every day. Mm-hmm. Yes, I've, I've had it. It's, it's all worn these years. down. How long have you been carrying it? Well, I had it since 1942 is when I uh, was given to me. And uh, the, the heart and the monad and the alpha and the meager are almost faded out. You can still see them, but they're still there. I've never seen another one like it, and I like that. I've got another one in the pocket I carry, but it's not like that, and it's not that meaningful. You have indicated that you're still trying to grow, still trying to learn. Yes, I think we should be every day when you're through learning, you're through. Uh, I think that's true. I think that was, uh, I, I think when I was teaching, I think I, I hope in 1975 I was a little better than I was in 74. And I know it was a lot better than it was in 1934. Uh, but I, I hope each year I was, uh, I, I was a little better than I was the year before. 
uh, there's always different ways of learning, maybe not in, in certain techniques, but there are other things. Uh, most important probably is uh, learning to work and listen to other people. When you uh, would greet a new team with a lot of freshmen mm -hmm. uh, and you had to start from scratch, where'd you begin? What'd you say to them on the first day? Well, the first day of practice or the first day I met with them? <laughs> yeah, well, either one. Well, I, I want to get across to them that the first thing that is that defense usually wins championships. And it's been absolutely disgrace. If any of you are a good def offensive player and you're not a good defensive player, uh, that's disgraceful. Now, a good defensive player might not be a good offensive player. And I understand that, but offensively, you, you better be a good defensive player. I want you to remember that. Now, offensively, I want you to know that uh, I want most of our baskets to come at the end of a pass, not at the end of a dribble. And here we permit no behind-the-back passing, uh, no behind-the-back dribbling, no fancy stuff. Uh, if you want that, we'll try to get you a job at the Globetrotters, or, or you can go, no, some, you can no go someplace show, else. No mm, showboating. No, no, no showboating. I want them to understand that. But I want them to understand that uh, two-thirds of our practice throughout the entire year <laughs> will be individual fundamental drills, and a third will be on trying to bring the individuals together in the team concept, and we must always think of the team first. Uh, if you had a player whom you suspected was trying to put numbers up for himself, uh, even though he was helping the team, what would you do? Oh, I had the greatest ally in the world, the bench. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for spending some time with us. You're listening to Family Talk, a radio broadcast of the James Dobson Family Institute. I'm Dr. Tim Clinton, Executive Director of the Institute, and we've come to the midpoint of today's broadcast. On behalf of Dr. Dobson and all of us here at JDFI, I want to thank you for listening today and, by the way, for your continued support. We're completely supported by you, our faithful listeners. We would not be able to bring programs to you like the one you're listening to today without your generous contributions. Learn how you can stand with us by visiting drjamesdobson.org. Let's get back to today's broadcast right now here on Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. Well, I've often said that the two most important words in the language are love and balance. And two of my bookcases at home one is love, and the other one's balance, and the third one is drink deeply from good books, especially the Bible. There are three, three of the bookcases that I have. And I do believe that, that love, love, I mean true love, lasting, uh, not passion, love, love. Passion is uh, temporary, love is enduring. And uh, that, that, that is the most important way, and it can be shown in, in many ways. Um, what is it in, in my book? Inch and miles uh, for children. Uh, uh, Charlie the Chimp is on friendship, and it ends uh, something like, uh, to be a friend is pain to see that you yourself, a friend, must be. Uh, love is indicated in that. Uh, let's see, there's another one. Uh, a bell isn't a bell until you ring it. A song isn't a song until you sing it. And the love that is in us wasn't put there to stay. Love isn't love. So you give it away, true love. And then the next one is balance. You have to keep things in proper perspective. Don't let things get out of perspective. And that is done, uh, done too much. Keep things in proper perspective regarding the, uh, in your, your profession. I use, uh, at times I say family, faith, and friends, and I say that's wrong, but I think he'll understand. It should be faith, family, and friends. They're the three important things, the three important things. If you have those, I'd like to know what else you need. Uh, freedom. Pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> but with faith, family, and friends, with faith, I kind of think you have freedom. When, uh, when your life is over, how do you want to be remembered? What we've talked about today are the things that we remember about you and admire you for. What do you want to be remembered for? As the coach that won 10 national championship? I'd like to be remembered as just someone who was considerate of other people. That'd be enough. That's it. Mm -hmm. While we're off here, I don't know if they've heard about this 
a fellow that was uh, going to the cemetery reading all the inscriptions. You know, that's where you find the perfect people. Just read the inscriptions, you'll find they're all perfect. <laughs> <laughs> one fellow came to one and said, as you are now, so once was I. As I am now, you are sure to be. So may I say, as here I lie, prepare yourself to follow me. And somebody had scratched under that. To follow you, I'm not content until I know which way you went. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, you know where I read that? Uh, it was a little earlier than what you just uh, read and talked about. Uh, Shirley and I last summer were in Rome Mm -hmm. And there is the Capuchin Monk's House of Bones. Mm -hmm. And this is a, um, a monastery which is filled with the skeletons of the monks. Mm -hmm. and, and when you come out, I mean, it's all over the uh, ceiling and the walls and everywhere. The clock is made out of finger bones. The skulls are, are on the roofs. So really kind of a... a spooky place mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, as as you're coming out of it mm -hmm. there's that little note that says that where you are we once were and where we are you will be and mm -hmm. it was that same and that was from the 1500s so we <laughs> scooped you a little bit there yep. and, uh, well, well did they have the one in there that said um, when you get to heaven you will likely view many persons whose presence there will be a shock to you <laughs> but don't look surprised don't you even stare Doubtless there'll be many folks surprised to see you there. <laughs> <laughs> Did they have that one? <laughs> you look forward to seeing the Lord someday? Of course I do. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to uh, be together through eternity. That's kind of exciting. Would you, would you take a little time when we get there to teach me to shoot? <laughs> 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 I have the perfect poem here on which to end our conversation. This was written by you, Coach Wooden, uh, and the title of it is Do Not Look Back. I'm gonna read it. The years have left their imprint on my hands and on my face. Erect no longer is my walk and slower is my pace. But there is no fear within my heart because I'm growing old. I only wish I had more time to further serve my Lord. When I've gone to him in prayer, he has brought me inner peace, and soon my cares and worries and all other troubles cease. He has blessed me in so many ways. He has never let me down. Why should I fear the future when I soon may touch his crown? Though I know down here my time is short, there's endless time up there, and he will forgive and keep me forever in his loving care. May I not waste an hour that's left to glorify his name of the one who died that we may live and for our sins took all the blame. Isn't that beautiful? Well, what a meaningful poem penned by the late John Wooden. His words are much more meaningful now that he's gone to be with the Lord, of course. Uh, he truly was a phenomenal leader, coaching some of the greatest players in basketball history. But as we've heard over these past couple of programs here on Family Talk, Coach John Wooden was also a man of tremendous character, and noble character is at the center of every good leader. Now, before we wrap up this program, I want you to hear a small clip that demonstrates his profound integrity. Here is Coach John Wooden addressing how he handled various racial issues on a team he coached. You may have heard something. Uh, when I was teaching at Indiana State University, I, um, I was there two years. In my first year, we were invited to the National NAI Tournament. I had one black player on my team. He didn't get to play very much. He was perhaps, I had a 12-man squad. He probably played the least of any of the 12 players. But he was a member of the squad, and I refused to go because they wouldn't let him go. Well, the next year, we had a better year. I think we finished 29-4, something like that. And um, we were invited again, and I refused. And uh, then his parents, and uh, I think it was the NAACP, uh, 
they they um, talked to the the people of the university, the, the president, and so on, and um, they uh, thought it'd be nice if he go. They agreed to let him play, but he couldn't stay in the hotel. We could have meals in the hotel as long as we had a private dining room. And I said no, but eventually uh, I was persuaded, and we he stayed with the minister and his wife while we we're there. You know, no problems in any way. He didn't get to play very much. But uh, that, that was a breakthrough. And uh, What year would that have been? That would be 1948. How disgraceful when you think about mm -hmm. it. A few years later, an all-black team happened to win that, that NAI tournament. But uh, I, I never had any problem uh, with racial relationships. And anyway, I'm very proud of after one championship game, one of my black players uh, and a reporter in my presence said, uh, Tell me about the, uh, your racial problems. And he straightened up. You don't know our coach, do He doesn't see racial problems. He sees ball players. And he turned, walked away from the reporter, and that pleased me. That pleased me. That mm. pleased me about as much as anything could have pleased me. Uh, you were known then for being colorblind, and you were. <laughs> well, I'd like to think I was without prejudice, but I, not, I can't say that. I, I'm not sure anyone is completely without prejudice, but I, I like to feel I was. I mean, you said you had some of the greatest black players in the history of the game. I did. I remember Sidney Wicks and that good. team won one year. See, I was following you. You didn't know that, but I was on the other side of town watching you. <laughs> Well, we hope you enjoyed this classic two-day broadcast here on Family Talk featuring the life and times of Coach John Wooden. It's our prayer that this program caused you to take a moment and think about your own legacy as well. You know, we all make some sort of mark on the people around us, either for the better or for the worse. It's important for us to be conscious and, and take a moment every now and again just to pause and consider not only the influence that we have on the lives of others, but also the importance of finishing well. Visit our broadcast page at drjamesdobson.org and learn more about the life of Coach John Wooden. Once you're there, you can also request an audio CD of this broadcast to revisit this conversation or perhaps even share it with a friend who might need a word of encouragement, especially about legacy. You'll find all this and more by going to drjamesdobson.org and then tapping onto today's broadcast page. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Be sure to tune in again next time for another edition of Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. I'm Roger Marsh. Thanks for listening. This has been a presentation of the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute. I've always loved the game of basketball, even though I've never been particularly skilled at it. My friends and I had gone to a conference in Laguna, California, which is a beach town populated mostly by surfers and sun worshipers. During an afternoon break, someone suggested that four of us old guys go down to the outdoor basketball court on the beach and challenge the young hotshots that play there. It was a stupid thing to do, but off we went. When we arrived, about 300 spectators surrounded the court where four-man teams waited to take their turn at the reigning champs. Well, we got in line and rumors began to spread immediately about who these old dudes really were. Some thought we were NBA scouts uh, checking out the talent. Others thought we were coaches from USC or UCLA. As for me, I've never been so nervous in my life as I waited to play the champs. But we finally stepped on the court and the impossible happened. We got hot and we hit everything we shot. Within two minutes, we were up eight to nothing. The crowd went crazy as people began to come from everywhere on the beach. Only three more buckets and we would have pulled off the upset of the century. But then reality set in and we lost 11 to eight. Alas, athletic immortality often hangs by the slenderest thread. I missed it by three lousy buckets. How close have you come? To find out how you can partner with Family Talk, go to drjamesdobson.org. This is Dr. Tim Clinton, Executive Director of the James Dobson Family Institute. Thanks for listening today. We hope you found this program helpful and encouraging. Please remember that our ministry is here to serve you and your family. For more information about our programs and resources or to learn how you can support us, go to drjamesdobson.org. That's drjamesdobson.org or call us toll free 
877-732-6825. I pray that God will bless you in 2020. We're so grateful for your partnership. We ask you to stand with us and to continue to defend the Christian values in an ever-changing culture. Thanks again for joining us. We hope you'll join us again on the next edition of Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. Hello, everyone. Roger Marsh here for Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. The news comes in all shapes, sizes, and formats these days, but how do you cut through all the noise and get to the heart of the matters that affect your family? Well, come to Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk and sign up for Dr. Dobson's monthly newsletter. You'll find clarity on tough issues, encouragement for daily life, and trusted principles to help you build strong, healthy, and connected families. Go to drjamesdobson.org and sign up today. That's drjamesdobson.org.